Thank you very much for having me here today. Um, growing up, in New Orleans, my best friend's middle child uh, was ultimately diagnosed with Angelman syndrome, which is a, a very rare condition. And I've seen uh, how active she has become as an individual, so I really, I am uh, always impressed with the passion that all of you uh, bring to these issues. My purpose being here today uh, is to assure you that even as a 501c3 organization, you have the ability uh, to lobby or influence legislation. What you will hear from all of the presenters, I think, is that 501c3s serve very important roles in affecting public policy. Uh, you are really the link to the patients and the families who are living with rare diseases, and uh, these are your powerful narratives uh, to share in an in impactful way. So I am going to try not to be overly lawyerly, even though I'm one of the few lawyers, I think, speaking to you today. I want to, I want to empower you. I don't want to overwhelm you with these rules. Um, my slide deck has a lot of content, and they will be posting it on the website. So you won't be able to see a lot, a lot of the small print. Um, but there's some key takeaways that I hope you gain um, from our time today. So 501c3 public charities can engage in an insubstantial amount of lobbying. This is different than the absolute prohibition on political campaign activity. Um, political campaign activity involves intervening on behalf of candidates for public office. Lobbying involves influencing legislation, and there's a lot of educational activity that doesn't even rise to the level of lobbying. Because the word insubstantial is not clearly defined uh, in the tax code, Congress enacted some rules to better define what is permissible lobbying. And these are referred to as the 501H safe harbor rules. Um, you may also refer to them as an electing organization. So if you choose to elect to follow these rules, you have a, a clear set of definitions and exceptions to lobbying, and you have clear rules for how much you can actually spend uh, on lobbying activity. The way you elect to be governed by 501H is you file a one-page form with the IRS. So one of my takeaways um, for you today is to go back to your organizations and find out, you may know if you have elected to follow these tax lobbying rules, but if you haven't, I think you want to seriously consider it, um, again, for the clarity in what is lobbying and for what you can spend on lobbying. And there's some real key uh, exceptions that help particularly small organizations with respect to volunteer activity. So what is lobbying? First of all, it includes an expenditure of funds. If you're actually not spending any money, you don't have lobbying activity. And we, we look at direct lobbying and grassroots lobbying, and we care because there are differences in limits on expenditures for the different type of activity. But, but direct lobbying is an attempt to influence legislation through communication with a member of Congress or employee of a legislative body, and that includes the federal, state, and local level any government official, but only if the purpose is to influence legislation. So it wouldn't include uh, communications and meetings with the executive branch if it's on regulations. And we also have the ability to communicate with the public on ballot initiatives if those end up being uh, important to your organization in a particular state. For direct lobbying to exist, though, the communication must refer to specific legislation and reflect a view on the legislation. Um, what is specific legislation? It's legislation that's been introduced or specific legislative proposals that are under discussion uh, that you support or oppose. Um, if any of these components don't exist, you don't have a lobbying communication. You have something else. You have information sharing or education. 
for grassroots lobbying, you're trying to influence the general public. Uh, and there's even more requirements for what constitutes a grassroots lobbying communication. You need to refer to specific legislation and reflect a view, just like direct lobbying, but you need to encourage the recipient of the communication to take action. So what I would call a, a call to action. The communication has to have this additional element. What is a call to action? Uh, if the communication states that you should con the recipient should contact their legislator or staff member, uh, if it includes contact information, the, the address, telephone number, web email address, et cetera, and encourages the recipient to contact, if it provides a tear-off postcard or some other kind of communication that can be sent in, or if it specifically identifies uh, various legislators who will vote on the legislation as either opposing it or being undecided or being the key players whose committee may be uh, considering the legislation. This is a technical point, but the first three calls to action directly encourage people uh, to take action. But the fourth type of communication does not, and so it could fall under an exception for nonpartisan analysis, study, or research, and I'll touch on that in a moment. So these lobbying rules do specifically provide some exceptions to what would be considered lobbying, and the first is nonpartisan analysis, study, or research. So if you have a communication um, that includes some analysis and the results are made available, generally available, then even if that, that report or analysis ultimately reaches conclusions and expresses a viewpoint, uh, it can still be a communication that falls under this exception as long as there really is robust analysis so that a reader could reach a conclusion based on the analysis presented and you do make it generally available. That could be posting on your website, that could be distributing it um, by mail. If, if the communication does directly encourage, however, someone to take action with respect to the legislation, then you're going to be subject to the general rules and you can't fall within this exception. The, the second exception is kind of similar. It's an examination of a broad social, economic, and similar problem. So again, even if you are communicating on a topic that is inevitably the subject of legislation, so long as there's a robust discussion and it does not uh, directly talk about the merits of specific legislation, you can fall within this exception. And again, there's some overlap and similarities between these two exceptions. You don't have to worry about where you're falling. You just have to ensure that you're not including a call to action and that there is this uh, sufficient discussion of the issue. And I think you know examples of these types of of issues would be healthcare in general, where of course there's gonna be legislation, but it's a broad enough topic uh, that there's been a lot of discussion and analysis over the years, particularly the last 10. The third exception is responding to a request for technical advice. Um, if, you, if your organization or a particular patient family receives a request to testify before Congress or before a committee, that falls under this exception. And I think this is a, you know, a powerful way, particularly as uh, particular families become more public advocates in different regions for issues. You know, I'd point to um, the use of cannabis oil in many states as an as a issue where there's clearly some, some public families who have taken the issue on. Um, if they receive an invitation to testify, that doesn't count as lobbying. So your organization could help affect that. You do need to formally receive the invitation, and it needs to be a written invitation, but you can you know, make known to your, at the state or local level, or the federal level, to your uh, legislators who particular, uh, you know, who would be particularly well suited to speak on an issue to testify. 
There's also uh, an exception that's referred to as a self-defense exception. This is rarely relied on because it really just relates to where Congress would want to change the rules uh, for 501c3 organizations. And so doesn't really um, serve a broad exception other than if they wanted to amend or, or change the specific rules that C3s have to live under. In another important area um, for patient advocacy groups that have members are exceptions for communications with bona fide members. A, a bona fide member you know, has to be something more than just a category that you, ref that you call people who either signed up for your newsletter, they need to pay regular dues, um, or have a, an ongoing contribution. So if you do have bona fide members, there are some additional exceptions for communications with them. If you only send a communication to member and it doesn't have a call to action, and this is really your newsletters, your alerts, your uh, communications to keep people apprised of developments, that's not going to be lobbying. Um, if you do contain a call to action, there's an advantage because that's treated as direct lobbying expenditures. So again, if, you're, if your activity is rising to the level of you have to really track what you're doing and you do have expenditures and you care whether something is direct or grassroots, um, this is an advantage because it can count as direct lobbying. If the communication is sent primarily to members, same thing. So more than 50% of the recipients, if they're members, as long as there's no call to action, there's no lobbying. If there is a call to action to get people motivated to contact legislators on a particular piece of legislation, then that gets to count as direct lobbying for your members. For your non-members, it's grassroots. So, you know, most of what I have covered um, under these tax lobbying rules has really focused on defining lobbying and what is or isn't. But these same rules also set out very clear uh, levels for what your expenditures can be. And that is another key advantage to going ahead and electing to be covered by these 501H rules. Um, if you have not made the election, what is an insubstantial amount is, is relatively undefined and it's not clear how, what you count uh, by way of only actual expenditures or volunteer time, staff time. If you elect to be subject to these specific tax lobbying rules, we know what gets counted and it's, it's your expenditures um, and you have a, a sliding scale for calculating the amounts that you can spend. For organizations that have less than $500,000 in exempt purpose expenditures, you get to spend 20% of that amount on lobbying activities. Again, a lot of what you're doing is not going to arise to the level of lobbying, but if you are lobbying and you have expenditures, that is the cap on what you can spend. The, uh, what counts as your exempt purpose expenditures, it's really your program related expenses, it's expenses running the organization, it's grants that you are making, and so you look at your annual expenditures uh, from a program perspective and you see where you are slotted in terms of those expenditures and that's how you can compute uh, the limit on what you can spend. I think, you know, is there a question? Okay, so I, organizations, in my experience, who have opted not to make the 501H election have tended to be uh, organizations that are so large that they really could end up spending more than what is perceived to be the cap here. So the absolute cap is a million five hundred thousand. For many organizations, that is just way beyond you know what what you could possibly spend. But for the very largest exempt organizations, 
there is some analysis of whether you know, the advantage of not having a specific cap and just being subject to this insubstantial standard works to their benefit. So I think you know, we have seen, again, the very largest organizations potentially not make the election, but for small organizations, it absolutely uh, provides certainty and gives you a framework for how you determine whether something is or isn't lobbying. So I've already touched on what exempt purpose expenditures are, and that's how you figure out what your limit is. Um, the sliding scale gives you a, a dollar cap, and of that dollar cap, 25% can be spent on grassroots lobbying. So that's why this distinction between what's direct and what's grassroots ends up coming into play. Again, this will only matter if you're at a point in your lobbying activities that you really are having to track because you have expenditures. You're not just relying on volunteers uh, and you need to keep the records to indicate what is or isn't direct or grassroots. The member communication exception I noted has the advantage of treating some of your communications to members as direct lobbying and that's helpful because you're not subject to this smaller 25% cap. The, the key takeaway here from these rules, if you do elect to follow them, is that volunteer time does not get counted. So you would only have to count um, expenditures relating to a session like this. If you were bringing everyone together uh, and your organization alone was paying to train people on the issue, that type of expense would get counted. But otherwise, if people are coming in on their own, you have a lot of volunteers involved uh, in your organization and who are actually doing the advocacy, then none of that is counted. And so you can see how, uh, particularly for small groups, you can be in a position where you can ultimately uh, engage in a very significant amount of activity that would not get caught up in these rules. So because I am the lawyer um, and I do advise 501c3 organizations, I do need to explain what happens if you blow your limits. Um, and again, you would only blow your limits if you have expenditures on actual lobbying activity that exceeds what's permissible. If you do exceed your limit, there's an excise tax of 25% of that excess amount that would be due by the organization and it would have to be included uh, with a filing and basically disclosure in your Form 990, which is the annual IRS information uh, return that gets filed. And if you were to exceed your limits uh, on an ongoing basis over a period of years by more than 150%, the IRS would have grounds to revoke your status. So those are the technical um, consequences. So we do have limits to what we can do, but it is important to, uh, I think, understand what you can do and not be intimidated by these rules and just um, be aware. Be aware of, of limits, count your activities that you have to count, but I can say, uh, you know, in 18 years of practicing, I've had no organizations uh, have their status revoked by virtue of lobbying activity. You hear a lot of chatter um, relating to 501c4s and political campaign activity and everything that's gone on over the last few years uh, in the tax exempt sector with respect to political campaign. Um, this is very different than lobbying and so I would encourage you to Educate yourself about these rules, but feel comfortable with them and, uh, and know that you are in good company as a 501c3 going out, meeting with legislators, and actually focusing on uh, these types of effective communications. The other thing I wanted to, to note that when you do have to determine what your expenditures are, we live in a world of electronic communications. Electronic communications are very cheap. They cost a fraction of what direct mail or some of our 
um, you know, older forms of communication would cost. And so I think, uh, you know, that's another thing to keep in mind. You can have a very effective program of lobbying or educating if you're not hitting the point of lobbying. And uh, even if you do have to capture your expenditures, it likely will be a very reasonable amount. So with that, uh, let me please open the floor to questions. Again, I hope I am empowering you and not intimidating you with tax rules, uh, but you, you have rights to lobby. You should use them.